in all conversations. There's a set of rules that need to be followed in order for a conversation to be a conversation. I'll have a quick look at these rules so that we can observe how they're being followed or broken in Graham Coder's interview with Chris Watts before Chris confessed to having murdered his wife and children. Also, I hope you can observe these concepts in action in your own daily conversations. First, we have the concept adjacency pair. An adjacency pair is conversational turn-taking and consists of a first pair part and a second pair part. The first pair part warrants and even demands the second pair part. Like the question-answer relation. If you ask your friend a question, you expect an answer in return. Or if you give the person your assessment of a certain issue, you expect them to acknowledge what you're saying. The part in between the first pair part and the second pair part is called the transition relevance place. This is where we have a completed turn constructional unit, such as a question or an assessment. During a conversation, if either the first pair part or second pair part is delayed, withheld or absent, it's typically a sign that one of the speakers has said something problematic, something that the other speaker doesn't agree with or seeks to modify. When a speaker disagrees with something, they'll typically find a polite way of expressing this disagreement to make sure that the other speaker doesn't lose face. Flat out rejections are typically avoided for as long as possible or avoided overall. As a general rule in face-to-face -face interactions, people are governed by politeness. When the first pair part has asked a question and the second pair part has provided an answer, we now have a so-called base adjacency pair. This is the main first pair part and second pair part. It serves as a base for multiple other first pair parts and second pair parts. These following first pair parts and second pair parts are called post-expanding because they're expanding the conversation beyond just the base adjacency pair. The post-expansion can include the first pair part disagreeing with what the second pair part has said. We get to see this in our analysis. Agreeing and disagreeing lead to the final concept I'll introduce here, preference organization, which deals with preferred and dispreferred responses. Responses that agree with the other speaker's statements are more straightforwardly articulated than responses that disagree with said statements. In general, people seek to find something to agree on, even very small details. So if a person is forced to give a dispreferred response, they typically mitigate it or elaborate it. Dispreferred responses are usually elaborated because they are designed to not be too direct. Therefore, they require more accounts, more words. These were the technical terms. Let's head to the analysis. Coda is the first pair part and Chris is the second pair part. I can't keep you in here. I won't keep you in here. Do you want to get right up and walk out of here? You can do that, okay? All right. Do you want to keep talking with me? I mean, I can. Okay. I mean, if that's what you want, I can keep talking. Okay. Coda asked a simple yes no question, but Chris's answer is not simple, it's complex. There's no minimal response, which is what we call yes, no, mm, and so on. Instead, there's a short turn initial delay before Chris says, I mean I can. I mean I can marks a dispreferred response. I mean is called a hedge. Hedges allow speakers to signal probability as opposed to certainty. I mean is part of the subgroup of evasive hedges, when the suspect wants to avoid the question. Also, with Chris's, if that's what you like, we get elaboration, which prolongs his second pair part answer. We get an initial hint that Chris is experiencing some level of stress here. If that's what you like, also shows a level of politeness that is uncommon if the suspect's innocent. His wife and children were still just missing at this point. Most people wouldn't be polite when faced with suspicion. Can we keep talking about some complicated things? Sure. Some things that are going to make you uncomfortable? No, that's fine. Okay. Um, and I think you know why I have to ask them. Okay. Coda's prefacing his base first pair part with the so called pre announcement. Just like we can have the post expansion of the base adjacency pair, we can have the pre expansion before the base adjacency pair. In this case, the pre expansion consists of the pre announcement with multiple first pair parts and second pair parts, as we've already heard. 
In the following, Coda continues his pre-announcement, but notice Chris's inserted sequence. Okay, and job. It's a hard job. It is a hard job. His politeness, a sucking up strategy continues. When we're right in the middle of a question, a statement that's obviously too problematic for Coda to just say right away, we don't expect the suspect to acknowledge the investigator's hard job. Coda also seems surprised by Chris's insertion, since he repeats the same statement twice. First he says it's a hard job with contraction, and then he prolongs the second one with it is a hard job without contraction. Coda continues his lengthy pre-announcement. Notice the way he flatters Chris to get him to talk. So you've done very good in talking to me about this really hard conversation you guys had. Okay, very good. That's sometimes hard. And I understand why sometimes someone in your position says, uh, doesn't want to tell me about that. Because please go help me find my kids and you don't need to know about my, my marriage argument. Okay, so I got to say you've done very good at that. Um, and I need you to keep doing that. There's a layer in Coda's flattery that I think Chris is oblivious to. Coda says it himself. He says he understands why someone in Chris's position wouldn't be as forthcoming as Chris. In other words, he suggests that Chris's behavior is unusual, which we know to be true. Chris, on the other hand, seems to actually think that it's the best strategy for him to keep being forthcoming or pretending to be forthcoming, because that's what Coda says. So, for a brief moment, Coda reveals what he really thinks of Chris's behavior and all the things that Chris is willing to talk about. Now we finally arrive at Coda's base first pair part, the key statement. So I need to ask you about um, your marriage and uh, infidelity. Okay. okay, tell me about it. Here, Coda selects Chris to talk. Selecting the next speaker is one of the three rules of turn-taking. Notice that Chris is not asked if he cheated on his wife. Coda's not offering Chris a simple and less stressful yes-no question here. Let's hear Chris's answer. No, I have never cheated on my wife. We, of course, know that Chris was cheating on Shanann, but his answer also foreshadows this. Many times what a suspect doesn't say is far more interesting than what they do say. Here, Chris doesn't say that he did not cheat on Shanann. He says that he's never cheated on her. People, even most killers, don't like lying, so they'll choose the least stressful way of lying. In this case, it's to replace didn't with never. Chris is telling us what he never did, not what he didn't do. In statement analysis, never in this type of context is always flagged as unreliable. Okay. And I fully suspect she's never done that to me. Oh, okay. Like, she's always been a trustworthy person, I've always been a trustworthy person. I fully expect if we ever thought about straying another way, mm -hmm. that we would tell each other before it happened. Chris involves Shanann, and thereby forms a we. This way, Chris avoids standing alone with these thoughts, and he makes the conversation about Shanann also. The base adjacency pair with the base first pair part and base second pair part has now been completed. We now enter the post-expansion with multiple first pair parts and second pair parts that build on this base. Coda starts with this very direct assessment. I think that sounds ridiculous. Okay. Because in the history of the Earth, nobody ever does that. Okay. <laughs> I just, I just, I just, uh... With this unmitigated dispreferred response, Coda breaks the rules of politeness that I mentioned in the intro. When a response is abnormal, it's normal practice to start laughing. The laughter intrinsically points to the uncomfortable nature of the response itself. It shows us that both Coda and Chris are aware that Coda gave a dispreferred response. Why are you falling out of love? Over the last five, the last five weeks, like being by myself and being able to be myself again, I couldn't be myself around you anymore. Why not? It was like I was walking. Just like, if, like, you know, like walk on eggshells type thing. It's kind of like, you don't, you feel like you're always doing something that's wrong. It's like, you, you feel like you're never like, doesn't make, does that make sense at all? The timing doesn't make sense to me. Chris is doing two things here. Number one, he makes a pronoun switch from I to you. 
This switch generalizes his statements so that he, linguistically, avoids being the only one with these experiences. Pronoun switches are always significant, because pronouns are largely intuitive. Words that the suspect has little to no control over. Number two, he's trying to appeal to and convince Coda. What's interesting here is that Chris implicitly appeals to the conversational rule that the other person should be acknowledging. However, Coda intentionally withholds the minimal responses that are necessary for a conversation to work. He shakes his head, which makes Chris ask, doesn't that make sense at all? Doesn't, as a negative question, indicate surprise that Coda doesn't follow, while at all is designed to get Coda to find something that he agrees with, even the smallest thing. This, along with Chris's excessive body language, shows inner stress. Besides just stress, I think we get a glimpse of one of Chris's personality traits here, that he's dependent on other people's approval of his opinions. If he doesn't get it, he backs down. In the following, notice how Coda continues to break conversational rules by repeating the question why and why not, thereby dismissing what Chris tries to explain to him. In the meantime, Chris continues shifting between a general and a personal level, and he gives very long accounts about how he feels. Chris's behavior confirms that Coda has stressed him out. Let's have a listen. When did you start pulling out? It wasn't in the last five weeks. It's been an ongoing process for probably about a year. Why? I just felt like everything that we had when we first started dating and met, like we met in 2010, everything, you know, a new relationship, spark, everything hot, have everything's great. Get married, everything's still great. And then like, you know, people just fall out of love. And that's, that's where I was. Like, I just felt like over the last year, I thought that, like, okay, maybe, maybe this is just like a phase. Maybe this, you know, like, just, you know, this is what happened. Like, you've been with somebody so long. Maybe, like, you know, the spark into there just reunited somehow, some way. But, you know, our conversations weren't the same. Like, when we were apart, like, everything was just, like, you know, short. And it was just, like, it, nothing felt right anymore. The disconnection was there. And it just never felt right anymore. But why? It wasn't better. Like, I just didn't feel it, like, it was like I didn't have that passion anymore. Why not? I, I, I really couldn't, I can't tell you, like, it, the passion, I, I didn't feel it in my heart anymore. Like, I really, I really can't, like, just give you a definitive answer other than that. If we're dealing with a truthful person, we expect them to give rather short accounts about their emotions. Chris doesn't. He overexpands, overemphasizes. Despite Chris's efforts at trying to convince Coda, Coda gives this dispreferred assessment. I think my heart wasn't in it. I gotta tell you, that sounds like a load of horse um, um, I know. Chris's I know is revealing. He admits that his own accounts sound unreliable. Furthermore, it echoes the personality trait that I mentioned earlier. When Chris faces resistance rather than acknowledgement, he gives up, perhaps because he considered Coda a greater authority. Coda seems fully aware of this, using it as a way of getting Chris to tell on himself. What about the girls? Bella and Celeste are the light of my life. I'd do anything for those girls. I'd step in front of a bullet so I'd put a train for those girls. First, notice that Coda only asked, what about the girls? Chris's overcompensating response, that he would take a bullet for those girls, as he calls his daughters, doesn't match the question. The question doesn't warrant it. And this makes Chris's statement sound like persuasion, rather than making it sound persuasive. Those girls is distancing language, impersonal. He doesn't say, my girls are my daughters. Something's wrong with his pronoun choice. Those is a demonstrative pronoun used to show the relative distance between the speaker and the noun. So obviously his use of those suggests that he's distanced himself from them in his mind. Finally, we should note Coda's withholding of minimal responses in order to make the conversation or lack thereof as uncomfortable as possible. In the following one minute passage, pay attention to Chris's continuing impersonal language 
and his use of you know. You know indicates awareness of the other person in the room. As an analyst, you are therefore attentive to possible persuasion. If you had to guess, if you had to put your finger on it, if you had to, you know, why do two people that are hot and heavy that have kids that they love, what happens? I mean, you can't take the kids into the fact into the factor because, like, when the love for your half for your kids is going to be like exponential. I mean, it, it'll no matter what, that will never die. Mm-hmm. Because those are your kids. Mm-hmm. That'll never die. Between you and your wife, like, the love that you have for each other, like, from start to finish, like, from right when you started to where your inter- if your relationship ends, like, some, like, when you're in that type of relationship, you're with someone for that long, something happens. Like, something like, if it's just conversations or if it's just like, you know, I mean, it's not attractiveness at all, like, it's just a connection that isn't there. Like, you know where you can, like, look at someone and, or just, like, put your forehead to their forehead and you just, like, hold them and you know what each other's thinking. That's a connection. I didn't have that connection anymore. Okay. What do I do? to help you walk out of this room and not look like the person who's responsible. You have to trust me that when I tell you that these two beautiful girls right here, I did nothing to them and to my beautiful wife, I did nothing to her. Like you have to trust me and believe me. Like I know you don't know me as a person, you you know me for like two and a half, three hours. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what your opinion is, but. Chris can't say their names. He points to the pictures as if he were talking about strangers. This tells us just how much he's already disassociated himself from them. He repeats the adjective beautiful about his wife and daughters. Beautiful is used as an overemphasizing linguistic element. It's again aimed at convincing Coda of just how highly he allegedly thinks of them. In murder cases, the killer often uses the word beautiful to describe his victims, to disguise the fact that there was something ugly and decaying in his relationship to them. Chris admits that he's concerned with how Coda perceives him. Unprovoked, he says that he doesn't know what Coda's opinion of him is. This tells us that Coda's opinion of him has been and is an issue for Chris, as I've pointed out. Innocent people in this situation wouldn't care what others thought of them, not even law enforcement. They'd be worried about their loved ones instead. Once again, Chris reveals guilty knowledge. I don't know what your opinion is, but you have to realize that these two beautiful girls right here and my wife, I had nothing to do with the disappearance. Like, they vanished, they were taken, someone take, has taken them, they're safe somewhere, we don't know. I had nothing to do with, these, with, this, with this act of like evil cruelty, whatever has happened here. First clue that Chris is being deceptive is his need to overexpand overexpand on how he doesn't want anything to happen to his family. A suspect's need for a lot of modifying or explaining after they've actually answered the investigator's question is flagged for deception because it suggests inner stress, and inner stress is typically the result of guilty knowledge. Chris's you have to realize, with vowel stress and have, sounds both commanding and selfish. Commanding because Chris indirectly admits that he hasn't been convincing and thus resorts to the last option he has, that Coda has to realize this, which is a non-argument. And selfish because it's very rare for an innocent person to be so heavily invested in sounding innocent. Chris is obviously more worried about himself than his family, and this is why his attempts at convincing fail. I had nothing to do with the disappearance, Chris says. This is distancing language for two reasons. Number one, I had nothing to do. As with his use of the word never, he's still not telling us that he didn't do it. This is an unreliable denial. Number two, he says the disappearance, not their disappearance. He can't even bring himself to use the proper pronoun. This, once again, underlines the impersonal relationship he has to his own family. He can, however, bring himself to be personal when talking about what may have happened to his family. 
because here he uses this. This is a pronoun that indicates closeness as opposed to those that he used earlier about his daughters. So this act of evil cruelty is much closer to him in his mind. Chris modifies it with or whatever has happened here, making his statement sound more unsure and open. But this doesn't change the fact that he initially said this. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.